Well, last weekend, uh, my wife Lorene and I traveled to Ohio to speak at a marriage event that was held at Christ Community Chapel in Hudson, Ohio. Happens to be the church where my brother Joe is the lead pastor. And we had a great time all weekend with family. My parents live there with my brother as well. And we had a great time at the event at their church. It's a wonderful church. We're actually looking forward to our own couples event, which is going to happen in February of 2018. And Lorene and I are going to share the speaking at that event with Pastor Jeff and his wife Erin. So that's going to be lots and lots of fun. Now, my brother lives in Hudson which is halfway between Akron and Cleveland. And he's lived there now for 25 years, which means my brother Joe is not only a pastor and a husband and a father of three grown children and the grandfather of four beautiful grandchildren, he's also, unfortunately, a diehard Cleveland sports fan. (laughs) And it's really so sad means he roots for the Cleveland Cavaliers in basketball, for the Cleveland Browns in football, and for the Cleveland Indians in baseball. Now, the Cavs did win the NBA uh, NBA championship two years ago, something my brother never thought he'd live to see. But the Browns haven't won an NFL championship since 1964, and they're 0-4 this year, which is worse than the Bears. Uh, And they've only won three games over the past three seasons combined. All right? And the Indians in baseball haven't won the World Series since 1948. And of course, last year, his Indians lost to my Cubs in the seventh game of the World Series. I love that picture for so many reasons. <laughs> now, my brother is competitive, very competitive. Now, I'm competitive, but my brother is fiercely competitive. He's the second in line. Uh, So even though he's suffered so much frustration and defeat and heartbreak over the years being a Cleveland fan, and even though he tries so hard not to hope for victory for his teams, he still does. He can't help it. Now, how many Cubs fans are here? A whole bunch of other Cubs fans. I think we can all relate to my brother because even though the Cubs won the World Series last year, ending a drought of 108 years, we're still hoping they win again, right? Last week, I saw a sports website called Fangraphs, and they do all these uh, metrics and computer-generated models and stuff, and they gave the Cubs a 48% chance at beating the Nationals in this current series. Now, you know, of course, it's one-to-one right now. And then they gave them a 25% chance of winning the next round of the playoffs, and then an 11% chance to win the World Series this year. 11%. Does that do anything to diminish your hope as a Cubs fan? Of course not. We still hope. But what is hope? Most people, most of the time, think of hope as optimism. Right? That is wishing for a good thing to happen. And that is hope, of course. But today we're going to look at a different kind of hope. Not hope as optimism, but hope as certainty. Now, we're working our way through uh, the great New Testament book called The Letter to the Hebrews in a series called Jesus is Greater Than. Now, the author, let me remind you, is writing to Jewish background Christians toward the end of the first century. They're facing a time of persecution and suffering, and some have begun to, to turn back to their old ways. And the author is writing to remind them, to encourage them, to exhort them and even warn them that Jesus is greater than. He's greater than all the prophets who've come before. He's greater than the angels. He's the eternal word of God who is the very agent of creation itself. But even though he is greater, Jesus became lesser in order to make the final sacrifice that covers the sins of the world to defeat sin and death. And last week, we looked at a beautiful passage that says, we have a high priest. Since we have such a high priest, let us draw near to the throne of grace. What a beautiful picture. It's telling those first century followers of Christ and us today that no matter how far we've been from God, No matter how long we've gone the other direction and turned our back on his truth and his grace, we can still draw near. Because Christ has gone ahead, we can come near through his grace. Now today we're looking at the certainty of our hope, 
our sure hope. We're going to pick it up in Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to read a bit and then stop to explain, and then we'll uh, break down this entire text. So Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. Now I'm going to stop there. I want you to see two things going on here that we might miss because we're not embedded in uh, Jewish background Hebrew culture. Uh, he, first of all, he's pointing us back to God's covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 12, God had said to Abram, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the covenant of God with Abraham. Now that promise was not going to be fulfilled for some 25 years until Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. But it was eventually fulfilled. Secondly, I want you to see what the author means when he says, God made a promise, and since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Now, what, what's going on with all that? Why the promise and then the swearing of an oath? Now, the practice of swearing or taking an oath was very significant in ancient Hebrew culture. It was like a contract that guaranteed a promise. Let's say in our culture today you have a sort of a, a handshake deal on buying a house. That's a good thing. But none of us would just go by the handshake deal. We'd want a contract signed so we know everything is good, so we know it's guaranteed. This was an oath, typically taken in the name of an authority that was greater. Now, we do this all the time, too, in our culture, just in a little different way. Politicians, for example, when they take office, will often take the oath of office, placing their hand on a Bible. So they're swearing by the name of someone greater that they will do that particular job. On the playground, children will say when they, when they promise to do something, you swear, you swear, pinky swear, right? Because a promise is good, but we want a guarantee. That's what's being talked about here. Verse 15, And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, God's promise and God's oath, in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Now the language here reminds us of the Exodus. The people of Israel in bondage to Egypt fled for refuge in the promised land. Today our refuge is in Jesus who as the high priest has made the final atonement for our sins. And it's to him that we hold fast. And now we come to the key verses we're going to look at today. Verse 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, don't get hung up on that last guy, Melchizedek. We're going to study him in depth uh, next week as we look at the next couple of chapters. But for today, we're going to start by talking about the nature of hope. That's the first point today, the nature of of hope. Now, I saw this story a few years ago, and it was at a time my boys were all playing Little League Baseball, so I noticed it and remembered it. But a man, the story goes, a man is taking a walk on a Saturday morning, happens to walk by a Little League Baseball field, and there's a game going on. He doesn't know anybody playing, but he stands and watches for a while. He watches for like 20 or 25 minutes, and the same team is up to bat the entire 20, 25 minutes. Hit after hit, run after run, they just keep scoring runs. So he becomes kind of concerned for the poor team out in the field. These are like eight-year-old boys. So he, standing behind the outfield fence, he hollers over to the right fielder, Hey, son, what's the score? Little boy turns around and goes, 18 zip, we're losing. <laughs> yeah, he goes, Oh, wow, I'm sorry about that. Kid goes, Don't be sorry, we haven't even come off the bat yet. <laughs> That's hope, right? Or is it? Every human being hopes. Every human being. To hope is to be human. 
And hope is defined as a feeling or desire for a certain thing to happen. Like, I hope the Cubs win. Or in my brother's case, I hope the Indians win. This is hope as wishful thinking. But it's still hope. But at a deeper level, hope is a longing for something better. For yourself, for your family, for the world. We all hope the people of Houston... The people of Puerto Rico recover after the devastation of hurricanes. We hope for that. We all hope that what happened in Las Vegas last week will never, ever happen again. We hope. Viktor Frankl was an Austri Austrian psychiatrist who survived the Nazi Holocaust, even a concentration camp. He later wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, in which his main thought was that the key factor that enables human beings to survive unthinkable suffering is hope. Hope is a powerful thing. But what is hope? Hope in what? Here the author reaches all the way back to the story of Abraham. Verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having waited patiently, obtained the promise. Now the story of Abraham is a story about hope. But we need to see it's a different kind of hope. God gave Abraham hope in the form of a promise, a promise that was then guaranteed by an oath. In other words, God doubled down on his promise, and then Abraham waited in hope for the promise to be fulfilled because his hope was anchored in the covenant promise of God. And that leads us to the second thing I want to talk about in this text, that is the anchor of our hope. The anchor of our hope. The largest ocean-going ship ever built, I believe, was called the Sea Wise Giant. It had several names over the decades. It was an oil tanker uh, built in the late 1970s, I think in Japan, and was the longest ship ever constructed. I think it still is. A little over 1,500 feet long, which means it's longer than the Sears slash Willis Tower is high. Uh, the Sea Wise Giant was sunk in the Iraq-Iran War, but dragged up from the bottom of the sea, salvaged, put into play for another 20 years or so. Finally, it was scrapped in 2009. And the only part of that ship that survives today is the anchor, which is 22 feet tall, 14 feet wide, and weighs 36 tons. Now, we all know the function of an anchor is to keep a ship from drifting in the currents, to hold the ship secure. Therefore, an anchor has to be heavy enough to hold. It's interesting that by the end of the first century or so, the early Christians used three uh, visual symbols for their faith, three primary symbols. First, there was the fish that many of you know was chosen because the, the Greek word fish, ichthus, is actually an acrostic for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So the fish became a secret symbol of the Christian fellowship. The second symbol was the dove as the symbol of the Holy Spirit. But the third symbol was the anchor. This um, wall carving was found in many, with along, along with many other wall carvings in the catacombs of Rome dating back to the third century. Scholars believe these images, you can see the anchor there, are in direct response to this single verse in Hebrews. Verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. What is it? What is the anchor for our souls? What's heavy enough to hold? We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Now, we've all seen the tragic and very disturbing images and stories from Las Vegas. Our whole nation uh, collectively struggles to make sense of the whole thing. Here are just a few examples of some celebrity entertainer comments that uh, we've heard. Late night talk show host Jimmy Kimmel said, we cannot give up on hope. Daytime talk show star Ellen DeGeneres said, I want this to be a show of hope. 
Comedian Stephen Colbert says, we want to hold on to hope. The question is, hope in what exactly? Hope in what? In the unending coverage of this past week, I saw, I just happened to see an interview with a psychologist who said the key thing after a tragic and traumatic event like this recent mass shooting is to, quote, restore our hope in the goodness of humanity. To restore our hope in the goodness of humanity. Now, at one level, I understood what she was saying, because no one can live every day thinking their next-door neighbor might be a mass murderer. You can't live like that. It's overwhelming and terrifying and crippling. But on the other hand, did you know that if you define a mass shooting as four people shot, wounded, or killed in one event, if that's our definition, then in America, there have been 273 mass shootings this year alone. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a lot of good in humanity. There are incredible stories of courage and self-sacrifice coming out of Las Vegas. Beautiful stories. But to say there's good in humanity is different than saying we should put our hope in the goodness of humanity. Do you hear the difference? Remember the historical context we're talking about here in the letter to the Hebrews. These early Jewish background followers of Christ were facing a time of terrible and frightening persecution. Historians tell us that the emperor Nero was lighting his gardens with burning Christians. In a sense, they're being swallowed up in a storm that was beyond their control or imagining. They had no hope of life ever getting better. Yet the writer of Hebrews wants them to have hope. Because their hope is not in their government. Their hope is not that the emperor will have a sudden change of heart and start treating Christians better. Their hope is in the sure hope of Christ the only anchor that's heavy enough to hold in the storm. See, I think it's very, very difficult for us as people living in 21st century North America to fully appreciate, to, to appreciate at all what the author is saying to these ancient people. And that's because most of us have lived our entire lives immersed in what could be called the American culture of optimism. We are unique among all the peoples of the earth because we believe things can always get better. We believe deep down in who we are that things will always get better. We believe the economy will be better. We believe our schools will get better. We believe our roads will get better. We believe that if you work hard, good things will happen for you and your family. That's what we believe. That's our culture. Our culture tells us to anchor our hope in our wealth, in our education, in our democratic way of life, in our health. But the truth is, those are all illusions. They're illusions. They're not anchors. They don't reach all the way to the bottom of the sea. They just aren't heavy enough because they move. They don't hold in a storm. The writer says only Jesus can anchor our souls. Why? Jesus is our anchor because he's the hope that enters behind the inner place, behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Now, there are two images here we need to understand. First, forerunner. The Greek word used here is podromos, which is used in Greek literature to refer to that um, soldier in an army that goes out in front to scout out where the enemy is. Sort of saying, Jesus is our scout. He's the point man who goes ahead. We'll see this image later in the book of Hebrews. But secondly, it, there's the image of the curtain. Now this curtain image comes from uh, the great temple in Jerusalem. And, and these readers would have immediately understood what he was talking about. The curtain was a great woven veil, 60 feet high, 30 feet, 30 feet wide, so heavy it took 300 priests to move it into place. And it stood between the holiest place in the temple, the Holy of Holies, 
where it was believed the presence of God dwelled in all his holiness and the rest of the temple. So it protected people from the holiness of God, that should they enter in an unclean state, it would consume them completely. And we're told in Matthew chapter 27, at the moment of Jesus' death, that curtain, that great veil, was torn in two from top to bottom. Now here's the image. The picture is that Jesus has gone to where we cannot go, to make a sacrifice that we cannot make, to cover sin that we cannot cover. Jesus undid that which we cannot undo. Therefore, Jesus is the anchor of our souls. Because Jesus alone gives us a new heart through the forgiveness of sin, new identity by adopting us into God's family, which means I am no longer defined by my human family, by my cultural background, by my ethnicity. I'm defined now by the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. He's given me new purpose, that is to serve in his eternal kingdom, and a new destiny, which is eternal life forever in the presence of God. And therefore, he is the anchor of our souls, for only Jesus is heavy enough to hold in a storm. Now, when these two images collide, anchor and curtain, we see something interesting. Because this anchor does not go down, this sort of metaphorical anchor, spiritual anchor, does not go down into the bottom of the sea. It actually goes up into the very presence of God himself. A collision of these two beautiful images, anchor and curtain, which leads us, thirdly, to the power of hope. The power of hope. Um, in the late 1950s, a psychologist named Kurt Richter, who was a professor at Johns Hopkins University, conducted a, a rather gruesome set of experiments with lab rats. Now, I was a psychology major in the 70s, and I had, I had to do experiments with lab rats, I had to teach lab rats, rats how to press a bar to get water. But this was a different kind of experiment back in the 50s, and it was, uh, I tell you ahead of time, it's a little bit gruesome. So what he did was, he took lab rats and put them in a big bucket of water. He wanted to find out how long they could swim before they drowned. And what he found out was, just average lab rats could swim 15 minutes, and then they would drown. And he'd let that happen. But he wasn't done. He took another set of lab rats, put them in a similar tank of water, let them swim, and before it got to 15 minutes, he rescued them. He pulled them out and let them rest. And then he put them back in again. And they swam around for 12 or 14 minutes, and he pulled them out again, let them rest. And then he put them in again. He did it like three or four times. And then the last time he put them in, he wanted to see how long they would swim. Do you know how long they swam the last time? Three days. For three days days, like 78 hours. His conclusion was that these lab rats learned that there was a possibility someone might save them. And that hope, he called it hope theory, helped them endure and swim much longer. It's the power of hope. Now, as human beings, we most often think in a linear direction. It's just how we are wired. So our assumption is we think of our past as determining our present, and our present as determining our future, right? That our lives, just like history, moves from past to present to future, and there's a cumulative effect, and of course that's true. But the hope that the writer of Hebrews is talking about, notice, moves in both directions. Let me try to explain. The author is saying that when our hope is anchored in Jesus, and we have the sure and certain hope in what he has already done. He went in behind the curtain. He's already made the sacrifice. That he is guaranteed now our ultimate inheritance over here in the future. That when we have that certain hope, that hope rushes back into our present to give us strength, endurance, and hope. It sustains us. I want to close with a story that a takes a little bit of time to tell, but it illustrates, I think, this point. Way back in uh, 1985, the year before I was called to come to this church as youth pastor, uh, my brother and I uh, led a six-week 
sports evangelism trip to Bolivia and South America. And I've told this story before and told many stories about my experience in Bolivia. Uh, we would play basketball games all over Bolivia, uh, which at that time was the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, right behind Haiti. And we would share the gospel at halftime and pass out literature after games, encourage believers, and just, uh, it was just an amazing experience, one I'll never forget. But during the very final week of that experience, so we'd been traveling for five weeks, uh, playing games almost every day, uh, we ended up in the region of Bolivia known as the Altiplano, the high desert. Uh, this is a picture of the Bolivian Altiplano. It's about 8,000 feet above sea level, arid, cold, spectacularly beautiful, and yet stark at the same time. Uh, the Altiplano is dotted with small villages or towns uh, inhabited almost exclusively by indigenous Quechua Indians. Uh, they're mining towns, mostly salt mines. So we'd play, we played a series of three games in three days on courts like this one, um, often the entire town would show up at the game, people who had never seen North Americans before and had never been exposed to the gospel. So it was incredibly interesting and fun. We'd play outdoors in the wind and the cold. Sometimes we had to wear long underwear uh, underneath our uniforms because it was 8,000 feet, it was cold. Uh, and then we'd jump on a train like this one and we'd, we'd travel all night to the next town on a really slow cold train. Sometimes without showering, even changing clothes, we'd still be in our uniform, we'd throw our warm-ups on, and go all night. Sometimes we'd, we wouldn't even have clean water to drink, so we'd be drinking Cokes and Fanta Orange. For some reason, there's Fanta Orange everywhere in the world, but we could get Fanta Orange. So by the third night, three nights in a row, we hadn't slept much, we hadn't showered, we were tired and thirsty and hungry, uh, but we had one more all-night train ride. And that night, I don't know whether it's because of the altitude or what, but there was no heat in the train. It was so cold on that train that the water that condensed or we spilled or something from our water bottles actually froze solid on the bottom of the train. So our socks stuck to the ice on the bottom of this train. My brother and I were sitting in the same little seat. We unzipped some sleeping bags, put them over ourselves like a cocoon, just two of us together in a cocoon trying to stay warm. And we tried to sleep just like that, leaning on each other all night. And at some point during the night, I don't remember exactly when, but I was trying to sleep, and I don't know if, didn't know if I was dreaming, but I woke up to the sound of, of kind of, 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 of whimpering. Like, <coughs> I thought there was a baby on the, on the train. I woke up, and I realized it was my brother, a grown man. And he was in his sleep. He was just whimpering. He was, we were so miserable. Well, we finally got to our destination, which was a town outside La Paz called Oruru. It was about 3.30 a.m. We'd never been to this town before. It was dark and cold, and somehow we got a bunch of cabs to come pick us up and take us to our hotel. But Joe and I were so sure that it was just going to be one more small Bolivian hotel with no hot water and no showers that we just told all the guys to go on ahead of us. You guys load up on the cabs, all this stuff, and send them on ahead. But we weren't being generous or unselfish. We were just being bitter. We just didn't want to go. And we just stood there on the, I remember, we stood there in the dark, complaining, not looking forward to the hotel. We finally get picked up, we go to the hotel. So imagine our surprise when we get to our destination, and there, kind of out of nowhere, is this six-story luxury hotel called Hotel Terminal. It's still there today. Uh, when we got out of the cab, we were dumbfounded. It was like seeing a mirage. We got out of our cabs, and we could actually hear, coming from inside the hotel, the shouts and screams of our teammates who were already in the hot shower screaming about the hot water. <laughs> it's like 3.30 in the morning, and they're yelling, and we could hear it. So we go running into the hotel, and we took our hot showers and went straight to the dining area, woke up the staff, and asked, asked for steak and eggs for everyone at 5 in the morning. And they did that. Now, here's the point of that long story. What if I were to make that trip again? Same exact trip. Five weeks playing ball games, five weeks traveling around, three days without food and without good water and cold at night on those trains, my feet frozen to the floor. What if I was going to make that trip again? What if I knew that Hotel Terminal was waiting at the end of that three days? Would that have changed the experience of the three days prior? You bet it would. Because... I'd say, hang on, guys. I know it's cold. I know you're hungry. I know you're tired. I know you want a hot shower, but hotel terminal's coming. It's coming. I've seen it. 
I've been there. That's what Hebrews is saying. The world is a stormy place. The wind is strong. The waves are high. And they threaten to overwhelm. But you have an anchor that's heavy enough to hold. Your sins have been covered. Your eternal destiny is secure. Your hope is certain. Because Jesus is greater. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, our world is in such desperate need of hope. We've seen it day after day this past week. And so often we put our hope in lesser things. We thank you for your word that reminds us there's only one anchor heavy enough to hold. Only one anchor heavy enough to be our hope. And that's the truth and power of Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the power of his hope, which is the anchor for our souls. Amen. Have a great day.